worship Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We give him praise for all that he has done for us and giving us a, a place to gather in the body of Christ. Uh, we praise him also, especially this morning, for some rain. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, we want to greet you in the name of the Lord. If you are uh, a guest, if you're not a member, our regular tender, you're a special guest. I hope you got a bulletin when you came in. If you did, you're going to see there's a welcome tab on the edge of that bulletin. Please fill that out, tear it off, and drop it in the offering plate because we do want to get to know you just a little bit better. At the end of the service, I'm going to be out here by the, uh, the welcome desk. Uh, if you are a first-time guest, come by and introduce yourself because we have a special gift for our first-time guests. Just say thank you for being here this morning. Now, this is a, a special morning. Uh, we are uh, actually uh, uh, coming off of uh, Veterans Day, and uh, we would be remiss if we did not recognize our veterans. This morning, I wonder if, uh, if you are a veteran, if you would be willing to stand this morning, if you're a veteran of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, regular, or, uh, regular Army, Reserve, in any way, if you served in any way, would you stand this morning? We want to thank you for your service. Thank you. We enjoy our freedom because of you. Thank you. Let's uh, go to the Lord and ask his blessing on our time of worship this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy and kindness. We thank you for the privilege of gathering here as God's people. We ask, Lord, that you would move amongst us, that you would convict us of sin and shortcoming. We pray, Lord, uh, if there is someone here who has never come to recognize that they are a sinner, they have never come to recognize that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, we ask, Lord, that you would convict them of their sin and convince them of their need for Jesus and, Lord, that they would flee to Christ for salvation today. Because, Lord, we want you to be glorified in every way possible this morning. And we know you're glorified in no greater way than when one lost soul comes to Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would be lifted up in every way and everything that we're done, we do this morning through the, the praying, through the preaching, through the singing. We ask, Lord, that you would be lifted up. For you have said that if you be lifted up, you'll draw all men unto yourself. And we just claim that verse this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would be glorified and that your name would be lifted up and that you alone would receive honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first song this morning is in the hymn book, hymn number 446, Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. May we stand as we sing. each other this morning in the name of the Lord.
152 shoe boxes they'll be going around the world boys and girls around the world will receive gifts and uh, with it they'll receive a gospel tract that will present the gospel of Jesus Christ as well so let's pray for this Heavenly Father we just uh, thank you for the privilege of being a part of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ we pray for these shoe boxes as they are going around the world we ask Lord that uh, you would use them mightily for your kingdom we pray specifically now for each child who will receive our boxes that we're sending out. We pray that you would draw them to salvation and a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would meet their physical needs for them and their family. We pray, Lord, that the knowledge of Christ would, uh, would uh, just uh, pervade their village, their town, uh, their community through this, uh, this ministry, this outreach. We ask, Lord, that the kingdom of God would expand and the darkness will be pushed back because of what we've done here. And Lord, we ask that you would just use this, this small uh, thing that we've done, this token, this sacrifice, to your glory, your honor, your praise, and the advancement of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. It's our prayer time, and uh, the altar's open for anyone who would like to come join us around the altar as we go to the Lord in prayer. Remember those people that have just had surgeries. I know Billy Whitlock, I think, may be coming home today, but he's had knee replacement surgery this week, and we have others who've had outpatient surgeries, and just pray for our members who have those special needs. Dear Heavenly Father, we Thank you, Lord, for this day and for the many blessings you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for Eastside and all its ministries. Pray that you would just be with each ministry and bless them. Lord, we lift up our Wana program and pray that you just continue to bless in it. We pray that you'd be with our faith outreach program. Lord, we pray that you'd just continue to be with our youth as, as they grow and help them, Lord, to serve you. 
Lord, we thank you for our seniors and our children's ministry. We just thank you for everything that's done and said here at Eastside. Pray that you'd just be with each group. Help each of us, Lord, to live our lives in a way that would be pleasing to you. Lord, we do thank you for our veterans and the sacrifices that they made for our country. Lord, we lift up our country. We pray, Lord, for our, our nation's leaders. Just pray, Lord, you just touch their hearts. Help them, Lord, to see that on the only way that America will be great is if we serve in God. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to guide and direct this side. We thank you, Lord, for our staff here. We pray that you'd be with Pastor Tim as he brings a message this morning. Pray, Lord, you just give him the words that we need to hear, that we'll be drawn closer to you, that we'll be the salt and light that you've called us to be in our communities, in our jobs, our schools, wherever we go. Help us to represent you in a way that would be pleasing to you, that would draw others to you. Lord, if there be one here this morning that does not know you as their personal Savior, pray, Lord, that today might be the day they receive you. Lord, again, we're just grateful for our church here, for our church family. Lord, I pray that you just meet each of the needs that uh, you know what each one is. Lord, we are grateful that you sit rain our way. Lord, help us to count our blessings. We're such a blessed people. Help us, Lord, to count our many blessings and just be grateful for all that you do for us. Thank you most of all, Lord, for our salvation through Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. For our offertory hymn today, I know in the bulletin it says, uh, Are You Washed in the Blood? But we're going to make a change this morning. Uh, Becky's going to come and lead us in a, uh, a new song uh, that some of you may have known. It's kind of hymn-like in its nature. There's a lot of good songs out there now that are uh, hymn-like in the way they're written, uh, but they're new hymns, so to speak. And this is one that's actually not new. It's been around a while, but uh, the name of it is We Will Remember. And I, I just thought it was really appropriate today. I don't know about your Sunday school lesson, but our Sunday school lesson was about reminding I think the, past, the word remind, Peter said in there three times in, in our passage this morning. Uh, so it uh, kind of goes with that. Uh, also, as we remember our veterans, I uh, want to remember them and the service that they have served for our country and just remember uh, what we have in this country. And, uh, but also as we approach Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving is a time as well to remember and be thankful in that way. So uh, it'll be up on the PowerPoint. Becky's going to lead us, and, but she's not going to sing herself. She's going to lead us as we sing. So the choir's going to sing, and we ask you to stand and sing, and the ushers uh, will come forward at the very end of the song. So may we stand as we sing.
so much to be thankful for this morning. Let's sing it again. I will remember. I still remember the day you saved me. Pray that you be with them, protect them, Lord, protect their home. Pray that you'd be with Pastor Lee. If, there, if there's one lost soul, let them be saved, Lord. And be used tithes and offerings. Just use to further them in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, choir. If you have your copy of God's Word, let's turn this morning to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> We're actually going to look at verses 1 through 7. I think the bulletin says Genesis 6 and 7, but actually just verses 1 through 7 of Genesis chapter 6. We have been journeying through the first 11 chapters of the book of beginnings. And we have been asking the question, how did the world get into the shape it's in today? Where, where did we come from? Where did everything come from? And these wonderful books uh, or chapters have been telling us how God began things and how things went terribly wrong. Now, so far in our study of Genesis, we have seen how fast gen uh, sin has spread in humanity. It began with God saying, Thou shalt not eat of the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in a single generation, it went from eating fruit to murder. Then it went on to mass murder. And now, in our script this morning, we're going to see that man has become so corrupted that every thought and intention of his heart is only evil constantly. Now consider that for a moment. A, a world ruled by beings whose every thought and intent is only evil continuously. God has seen this, and he has resolved to do something about it, and he has decided that he is going to wipe the slate clean and essentially start over. Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall, shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and bore, they bore children to them, those who were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord said that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every, thought, every intent of the thoughts of his heart were, was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, Creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you <coughs> that you've given us your holy, inspired, and inerrant word. We thank you that it is absolutely trustworthy, completely truthful, and without mixture of error. We ask, Lord, that we would see what you have to, to uh, uh, tell us and show us in your word this morning. The Lord will respond that we would understand, and the Lord, that it would change our lives, that we would be impacted by knowing the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. As I prepared this message, I went through the internet looking for lists of the, the biggest disasters, natural disasters, in the history of the world, and, and sure enough, I came across a number of lists that classified the greatest disasters in the history of the world, and as I was going through, I saw it, it listed things like a typhoon in Hong Kong, a landslide in Peru, a tsunami in Japan, a volcano in Indonesia, an earthquake in China, a cyclone in Bangladesh, a drought in Africa, a flood in China, a hurricane in Bangladesh, and, and it listed as the greatest natural disaster in the history of humanity. It listed a, a famine in China that apparently killed 40 million people. That's incredible. Forty million people killed in a single famine. But as I read that list, I couldn't help but think it, it's woefully incomplete. <laughs> because the truth is, the greatest disaster that has ever befallen humanity, the, the greatest d uh, natural disaster, uh, we call it natural, but in fact it was brought about by God himself, this greatest disaster of all had to have been Noah's flood. That, that has to take number one spot. Everything else is pretty much a local event, a local disaster, a local catastrophe. Noah's flood was worldwide. Every human being on the planet, except for Noah's family, 
was destroyed by this flood. The event itself is so huge that it's mind-boggling. You think about a flood of that magnitude, a flood that is so great that it affects every dry spot on the planet, every valley, every mountain. There's nowhere to flee to, nowhere to hide from. It affected every place. Why would God do that? And that's the question that, that comes to mind when you, you hear about Noah's flood. Why would God do a thing like that? What did man do? What was the sin that was so great that it caused God to essentially hit the delete button on the human race? What, what did we do? What, what happened in that day? What sort of thing brings about that kind of judgment? Well, to get the answer, we need not look any farther than Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 24, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus is speaking about his return, his second coming. And in doing so, he references the days of Noah. He says in Matthew 24, 37, But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of, uh, the coming of, the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. The coming of the Son of Man will be. In verse 39 there, he says, they did not know. That's interesting. They did not know. They did not know what? They did not know about God's judgment. They did not know about the impending end to their world. It was a day of enlightenment, and yet they did not know. It was a day of great progress, and yet they did not know. It was a day of great military might, marvelous men who, who served and, and fought, men of great valor, and yet they did not know. A day of art, a day of literature, and yet they did not know. They thought they knew so much. But the truth is, they understood very little. They did not know because they no longer had time for God. They had forgotten God. They had forgotten His laws, His rules, His statutes. They had forgotten the very reason that they had been created in the first place, which was to give honor and glory to Almighty God. They forgot God. Folks, we live in a day that has forgotten God as well. We have forgotten God. People marry and are given in marriage, and they do not know. We live in a time of great progress and invention, of technological marvels, and yet people do not know. We live in a day of an age of, of art and literature and music, and people do not know that one day Christ is going to return. Amen. One day they will stand before the God of the universe and have to give an account. They do not know because they've forgotten about God. They've left Him completely out. Let's look back at Noah's time. What was going on in that time? Well, the Bible says that great sin fell upon the earth. And, and specifically, he says here, it was a result of the fact that the sons of God married the daughters of men. Now, that's a very interesting phrase there. The sons of God married the daughters of men. And it's kind of a cryptic thing there. What's he talking about? Well, there are a number of ideas about what he's talking about. Some people believe that uh, when he says the sons of God married the daughters of men, that the sons of God were actually great kings, potentates, uh, powerful, wealthy men. And what they did was uh, they were considered the sons of the gods. They were the great men of their day. And so what they did was uh, they began to uh, 
build great harems of women the, from the, the ordinary common men. They went out and took the daughters of common men and they built great harems. And, and this was a, a rejection of God's model of one man for one woman for life. It was a, a, a complete abandonment of God's model for the family. Some people say that's what they're talking about here. Actually, the oldest and, and perhaps most popular idea is that the sons of God were actually fallen angels. Angels who, who uh, left their place and took human form and intermarried with human women and, and bore these great men that he talks about, these, these uh, giants and these great men. As a matter of fact, some people will, will even point to a couple of scriptures in the New Testament that they say may actually describe what happens here. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. The argument here is that the sin they committed was that they intermarried with human women. Jude, verse 6, says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. The problem with that view is that Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 22 that angels do not marry, that they do not marry. Now, if God created them so that they did not marry and they do not reproduce, I, I don't really think it is likely that they would be attracted to human women. I don't see why they would, they would enter into that kind of relationship. Personally, I think the best understanding is that the sons of God refers to those who were followers of the one true God. The line of Seth and Cain were still in, in the world. And, and the line, the descendants of Cain, were those who rejected God, who did not follow after God. They were the wicked, they were the evil ones. And there is the line of Seth, through whom the, the ultimately the Messiah was going to come. They still followed the one true God. They were the sons of God. And so what happens is these sons of God begin to intermarry with those who are the daughters of men, those who are not believers in the one true God. And so the faith is not passed on from one generation to the next generation. Their belief in the one true God becomes watered down and eventually becomes almost extinct. In our day and time, God has told us that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? Verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the faith in one true God, those who, who follow one true God, fail to pass that on to the next generation. The, the knowledge of the Lord, the, the uh, awe and reverence of the Lord began to be watered down and virtually disappeared from the face of the earth. And it got to the point that the wickedness of humanity was so great that God says, and this is just mind-boggling, that every intent and thought of their heart was only evil continually. That word intent here, it's the word that comes from someone who is making pottery. They're shaping a pot, and they have a design that they want to make. They know what they want to make. Before you make the pot, you have a design, an idea. Well, what do you want to make from this? If you're doing a great work of art, you have an idea in mind, a design that you want to create. And what he's saying here is that they were designing, creating nothing but evil. Lives of wickedness. Lives of evil. They were creating, designing a society of nothing but evil, of wickedness, of iniquity. Continually working towards evil. They were deliberately trying to reshape society in an evil and wicked and godless pattern. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 describes people like that. It says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 
They got to the point where they considered evil to be good and good to be evil. Yet we live in a society like that today, don't we? It is amazing. We look around us today. We, we see people calling good evil and evil good all the time. We see the, the militant atheists in our society who want to drive everything that has to do with God, that has to do with Christ, that has to do with the church. They want to drive it out of our society. They want to drive it out of the minds of our children and our young people. They want to build an atheistic, secular society. They call evil good and good evil. We see the same in the radical homosexual agenda. We see the same in, in racist organizations. They call good evil and evil good. What's God's response here? Verse 6. We have probably the saddest statement in the whole Bible. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Now, the old King James says that it repented God that he had made man. Now, that is a, a figure of speech here. God does not really repent or regret anything. God knows everything from the beginning. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything that will happen. So he doesn't really regret anything. Well, what does it mean? Well, I think it explains it here. He goes on to say that he was grieved in his heart. He was pained by man's wickedness. God was pained, grieved by man's rejection of him. Folks, grief, grief is a love word. You don't grieve until you've loved. You, you don't grieve the loss of someone that you never cared about. You don't grieve... Uh, being hurt by someone that you really don't care for. God loved mankind, and he is grieved because mankind has turned against him, has rejected him, and forgotten him. His patience has been abused, but even the patience of God has limits. Judgment's coming. Verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, there are, there's a lot of discussion about this 120 years. Some people believe that God is saying here that man's lifespan will be reduced to a maximum of 120 years. Uh, others believe that what he means is that it's going to be 120 years before the flood comes, that basically he started the clock ticking. I think that's probably the best understanding here. This point here, he says, 120 years, and then time's up. God's spirit does not strive with man forever. God is patient. God is loving. God is kind. It is not God's desire that anyone be condemned but God's patience has an end, too. God's Spirit will not strive with man forever. It did not strive with man in forever in Noah's day, and God's patience has a limit in our day as well. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unliving, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Paul says, listen, there comes a point where God just turns you over to your wickedness. There comes a point where God says, listen, I have strived with you, I have showed you the truth, but you've come to the point that you've just said no, 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 
And finally, God says, okay, have it your way. Have it your way. There comes an end to God's patience, where God stops striving with man. Now, this is important. I am talking this morning to that person who has heard the gospel over and over and heard the truth that you are a sinner and that God has said that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm talking to that person who's heard that message. You've heard it over and over. You've sat in pews. You've listened to it on the radio and on television. You've heard it at this church and other churches. You've been to crusades. You've heard it over and over. And you've said, no, 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 no. The day will come when God will say, okay, have it your way. I've heard people say, Pastor, I can't believe a loving God would ever send anybody to hell. God does not send anybody to hell. You choose that for yourself. If you say no to the Holy Spirit one time too many, the Bible says that God will simply turn you over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. And the consequences are eternal. Verse 7. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Now I know there are those out there who have problems with the story of, the, of Noah and, and the flood and that, the idea that God would do this. Uh, they say that that's just too drastic. How would God do something? Why would God do something like this? Understand this. Understand this. God created all things. He created human beings, the plants, the animals, the whole universe for His glory. See, that's why you were created. You were made to glorify and honor God. That's why God made us. That's why He made everything for His own glory. And what's more, He deserves it. He deserves it. So when we refuse to give glory to God, when we refuse to honor and serve Him, we are depriving Him of the very thing He deserves, of the very thing we were created to give Him. And folks, we cannot argue when God destroys the thing that belongs to Him. The earth belongs to Him. He can destroy it if He wants to. We belong to Him. He can take our lives if He wants to. They're His property. We are His property. He owns it all. Still, God is patient. He says 120 years. I'll give him 120 years. Folks, he is patient today. It has been 2,000 years since Christ came and declared that there is salvation through faith in his finished work on the cross. It's been 2,000 years. God has been patient for 2,000 years. I had a professor at Clemson years ago. He was a Muslim, and I, he, he found out I was a Christian. He told me one day, he said, it's been 2,000 years you've been waiting for him to come back. How long are you people going to wait? It's been 2,000 years because God's patient. God is long-suffering. It is not his will that any should perish. That's why he has waited so long. But on one day, one day... God's patience runs out. There is a day that God has chosen when time will be up. There's a day that God has chosen when our opportunity to decide for Christ will come to an end. It may come to an end when Christ appears or it may come to an end when we die and go to meet Him. But God has appointed a day and the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking on my life and on your life and the life of every person in this world. 2 Peter 3.3 3. 
Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. It's been 2,000 years. How long are y'all going to wait? For this they willfully forget. But by the word of God, the heavens, of old, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Folks, there are natural laws that God has set in place that you will ignore to your own peril. If you get too close to a fire, you're going to get burned. If you jump off of a tall cliff, you're going to fall to your death. Those are natural laws. You can't change them. And there, just as there are natural laws, there are spiritual laws as well. God has set in place certain spiritual laws that are just as incontrovertible as natural laws. You can't change them. And one of those laws is the law of sin and death. In Ezekiel 18, God sets out the law, the spiritual law of sin and death. The soul that sins shall die. He set it out in the Garden of Eden. He told Adam and Eve, if you eat of the fruit, you will die. Now, by death, he meant that they would die physically. He also meant they would die spiritually. By spiritually, I mean they would be separated from God for eternity in a place called hell. God has set that spiritual law in place. The soul that sins shall die. It's a law, but God has made another law. It is the wonderful law of salvation by grace through faith. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Notice the evidence that you are in Christ Jesus is how you walk, how you live. You don't live according to the flesh. You live differently than the world. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. There's a new law. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Today, this morning, right now, you are under one law or the other. You are either under the law of sin and death that says the soul that sinneth shall die. And the bad news is we've all sinned. Scripture says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Remember, not just physical, but spiritual death. But the gift of God, the gift of God is that you can be found under another law. The law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, believing that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, and you give your life to him, you are changed. You are made a different person such that now you live a different kind of life. You walk differently. You talk differently. You think differently. You behave differently. You're different from the world. 
because Christ has come into your heart and changed you and made you a new creation. If you are under that law, you don't have to worry about the law of sin and death. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may also be. God has prepared a place for us in heaven. He's prepared a place that we can be with him for all eternity if we are found under the law of grace and faith. Let me ask you a question. Which law are you found under? Are you like the people in Noah's day that are under the law of sin and death? That have forgotten God, ignored his existence, refused to acknowledge his laws and his, his claim on your life? Or are you a person who is found under the law of grace and faith? Found in Jesus Christ. As the Bible says, this is the day of salvation. Today, you can receive Christ. Today, you can be changed. Today, you can be made a different person by the work of the Holy Spirit. In just a moment, we're going to sing a, a hymn of invitation. If you have decided that you want to be found under the law of grace and faith this morning, I'm going to invite you to step out into the aisle, come to the front and say, Pastor, I believe in Jesus. And I give my life to Jesus. I'll pray with you and I'll show you how you can, how you can uh, begin your walk with Christ, how you can begin to live for Jesus today. Let's be obedient. Don't put it off. Remember, the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. You don't know how many ticks you got left on your clock. We don't know how many ticks we got left in this whole old world. Do it today before it's eternally too late. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have loved us enough that you have made a way that we could be made free from the law of sin and death. Lord, we pray that there will be no person under the hearing of my voice this morning that would fall under the condemnation of those in Noah's day, that they have forgotten you, that they do not know you. But the Lord, every person under the hearing of my voice would know Christ as Lord and Savior. Change us, Lord. Transform us. Convict us of our sins and shortcomings that we might repent. Give us a sense of urgency, Lord, both to come to know you as our Savior and also to tell our friends and neighbors about Christ. We ask, Lord, that you move in power now during this time of invitation, that you might be glorified and lifted up in Jesus' name.